Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Professor Andreas Velindovsky. I'm head of School of Mathematics and Physics, which uh, hosts uh, uh, Lincoln Math and Physics Week as part of uh, British Science Week uh, 2021. Uh, I welcome you to our astrophysics lecture of this afternoon. But uh, before we start a lecture, I'll introduce uh, uh, the hosting school and hosting university which organizes all these events. Uh, those of you who come to more than one lecture uh, will, uh, uh, will listen to this presentation uh, several times. Uh, so by the end of the week, you will know everything by heart. However, those who just come for one lecture, this is basically uh, time for them. And now I will say just a few words about our school and university. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Velendowski, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln, which hosts the Lincoln Mass and Physics Week 2021. Uh, this week uh, forms a part of uh, uh, British Science Week, which runs also the same dates. Uh, this year we have uh, our um, events, uh, lectures, all online. Uh, traditionally, in previous years, uh, you would come to our public lectures to our lovely campus uh, uh, by the uh, Brayford Pool, by Waterfront. This is how campus looks um, in the evening. Uh, but today we, uh, we do it online, uh, and in my introduction I just would like to give you a few words about uh, uh, our uh, uh, university and the school which organizes these uh, uh, lectures. Lincoln is a, a small city for approximately uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, our university is uh, uh, right next to the center, just about 10 minutes uh, walk city itself is quite old. It was already found by Romans uh, soon after they came to the British Isles. Uh, once it was also a base of famous Legion 9 Hispania before Legionists moved to, uh, uh, to York. Uh, the city received quite earlier uh, in 86 uh, prestigious status of a colonia. So it became Lindum Colonia, and Lincoln name came later on. And that already happened in times of Emperor Domitian. Uh, the place uh, <clears throat> had a forum and a bath and uh, all uh, facilities uh, of Roman times and was a, a place for uh, retired uh, legionaries. Uh, even today, you still can find uh, remains, Roman remains, and you can walk or drive under this uh, uh, Roman arch of uh, Roman gates. The only one in Britain through which uh, traffic is still allowed. Next big step in Lincoln development uh, was in times of another visitors, the William the Conqueror, William the First. Uh, uh, came to British Isles. Uh, very soon he ordered to build a, a famous uh, Lincoln Castle on the top of Lincoln Hill. And uh, uh, some years later, uh, also even more famous Lincoln Cathedral uh, started to be built uh, just opposite to Lincoln House. Uh, this cathedral is considered to be uh, one of the uh, most beautiful building, if not the most beautiful cathedral uh, in Britain and probably uh, around the world. Uh, for some period of time, that was in fact the tallest building on the planet uh, when a uh, wooden spire was uh, uh, on the top of a main tower. Uh, cathedral uh, is, of course, uh, was a seat of uh, learning already from Middle Ages. However, university appeared in Lincoln uh, much later, in the end of the uh, 20th century, 
uh, campus uh, by the waterfront was opened uh, by Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, uh, much later, already in 21st century, uh, College of Science uh, was opened, which included School of Mathematics and Physics, uh, which opened its doors in uh, 2014. And three years later, we also opened our own building, which uh, we share with schools of engineering and School of Computer Science. And just uh, in about months, uh, we will be celebrating four years of this beautiful Isaac Newton building, named after Isaac Newton, a gentleman who also uh, comes from Lincolnshire. And uh, our lectures are primarily aimed at those who study mathematics or physics at A levels, because they're accessible to everyone who is curious <clears throat> about maths and physics. Uh, but maybe those who study a maths and physics level will think about continuing the education after the school. And therefore, I'll mention what our school has here on offer uh, regarding degrees in maths and physics. As you see, we have full range of degrees, uh, bachelor, three years degree, and integrated masters, both in mathematics and in physics. Uh, we have also various combinations, uh, for instance, combination of uh, <clears throat> another Asian subject, uh, one of the most ancient subjects, philosophy. So we have a degree in mathematics with philosophy and physics with philosophy, where philosophy is a minor component and physics or math are a major component. And we have also a combination of mathematics and computer science and mixture of mathematics and physics as well. And with that, I welcome you to our uh, uh, next event in Lincoln Mars and Physics Week 2021. And I hope you will enjoy it. Welcome. Hello, and now we move into our main part of the program, which is an astrophysics lecture by our speaker of tonight, Dr. Phil Sutton. Uh, hello, Phil. Hello. Uh, uh, just uh, to introduce uh, Phil, um, uh, Phil is a lecturer of astrophysics in our school, Lincoln School of Mathematics and Physics. Uh, uh, Phil uh, received his uh, undergraduate degree from uh, uh, a university not far away, from Nottingham Trent University, and that was degree in physics with astrophysics. Uh, uh, that uh, followed uh, uh, with a, a doctorate degree, a research degree, so-called PhD, in astrophysics, uh, uh, also not so far away from University of Loughborough. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, PhD work uh, completed in 2015 uh, uh, was uh, uh, in part uh, uh, about uh, Saturn rings, very enigmatic uh, object uh, in the solar system, and uh, uh, using data from uh, uh, famous uh, uh, Cassini mission. Uh, from 2017, we are very happy to have uh, Phil with us here in Lincoln, and uh, we are most happy to have uh, him uh, talking tonight. Uh, I remind everyone that uh, you can ask uh, questions, uh, any questions you might have to fill, uh, which you can type in directly in a live chat of this YouTube channel, so somewhere uh, below the, over there, uh, you can uh, uh, type your question, or uh, you can place your question uh, completely anonymously in a Padlet link. Uh, that link is also provided uh, for you in uh, YouTube uh, uh, live uh, chat. So whatever you like, please enjoy. 
Floor to you, Phil. Thank you, Andre. So I will just sh share my presentation, hopefully. So we should now see what we're going to be talking about. So what I wanted to kind of do today was look at, you know, exoplanets, some of the interesting worlds that we have you know, discovered so far and how we might actually find them as well. So that, that was kind of what I wanted to go through. And actually, I've got an interesting image there on the screen, which is actually Pluto. So, you know, quite a long time, well, it's only until quite recently, we've got quite close up images of Pluto. And we thought it might be just a kind of boring ice world. But actually, when we get spacecraft nearby, you know, it's a really exciting, um, interesting world. So I'm going to kind of introduce how we find some exoplanets and some of the most interesting ones, because doing some actual research again this week, I've updated some things and I found some you know, really interesting planets that have only just been discovered. So I will mention them kind of at the end. But where are we at the moment? Well, at the moment, we've got just over 4,000 exoplanets that have been confirmed. There's about a similar number, really, which we would classify as candidates. So candidates are planets that we may have had a weak signal for, we may have had just one signal, so we can't confirm them, but we've got a you know, pretty good idea there might be a planet there. So this number is likely to increase quite significantly. But I've put a plot on the side there, which shows you the number of detections or the, num yeah, the number of actual planets discovered per year. So you can see kind of we didn't really have much you know, from the 90s, then one or two. And then, you know, from like 2010 onwards, we've had a huge explosion in exoplanets. And that's predominantly thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope. So that was designed to look at hundreds of thousands of stars at the same time and detect planets that passed in front of them. And it released, well, you can see there where it released some of its data. Um, you got a huge influx of detected planets there, which is the green. So that's kind of where we are. That was taken from the 4th of March because actually they haven't updated their website today. So that's the latest one I've got to show you. So detection methods. There's two main ones. Now there's actually quite a lot, but I'm not going to go into them all because the main ones are actually from the transit method. So this is where a planet passes in front of the star. So it passes in front of the star, blocks out some of the light. We detect that dimming of the star. We can detect a planet. It's fairly straightforward. It's not that complicated. The only hard thing is, is the planet's got to be a suitable size that we can detect that dipping of the light. You then also have um, a radial velocity method. So that you may be more familiar with the Doppler effect. So when something's moving away from us at some speed, you get a stretching of the wavelength. If it's light, it can be any other wave, really. Um, and we would call that like a redshift. And if it's moving towards us, we get a blue shift. Now, we think of planets orbiting stars, but in reality, they both orbit a common centre of mass. So that common centre of mass is actually closer to the star. So the star just appears to kind of have a bit of a wobble. We can detect that by measuring the light, measuring the shift in that wavelength. So those are the, the two most common methods for detecting an, uh, an exoplanet. But it's worth noting at the bottom there, we have actually directly imaged planets around other stars. So Maybe I didn't mention at the very start, when I talk about exoplanets, we're talking about planets that are orbiting stars other than our sun. So these are not in our solar system. These are a long way. But the fact that we've actually got images of these planets, quite exciting, actually. And at the bottom there, you've actually got four big planets orbiting a central star. So you've got B, C, D, E. And they're quite big, obviously. And they're quite a long way from the star. So on the, on the scale in the bottom right of that picture, you've got 20 AU. Now, one AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So you can get a feel for how far away those planets are from their star. It's easy to detect. They're not close to the star. We can see them because they're not blinded by the light from them. But what I really want to kind of go over today was just the transit method, because it's the one that you don't necessarily have to have any understanding in physics or mathematics to get an idea of how it actually works. It's a fairly intuitive one to understand. But first, we're going to have a look at variable stars. So we know that when we're looking for a planet that passes in front of a star, we're expecting the brightness of that star 
for the magnitude of it to change, so it would actually get dimmer. But there's lots of other reasons why stars would actually change their brightness. And a lot of stars, they don't, they're not static. They don't just stay a set brightness. And if you look up into the sky long enough, you'll see stars do change in their brightness. And I've got, a, there's an Im image here taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a particular variable star. And this is actually kind of um, a long way in another galaxy. I mean, you can see it's kind of a changing brightness and almost colour as well. And then on the right hand side, there's another one in the centre of that image. You can see it getting brighter and dimmer. So we have these types of variable star. And um, these particular types, they also, um, well, they pulsate. So here you can see the star actually pulsating. Um, and they, they do actually physically change shape. So they get bigger and they get smaller. And as a result of that, they become more luminous and less luminous. And it causes a regular pattern in how bright they are. And interestingly, those type of stars are actually really useful for calculating distances because the period that they, they kind of pulsate at directly relates to how bright they actually are. So if we can measure how bright they are or their apparent magnitude, we can work out how bright they actually are if we were next to them and we can work out a distance. So we use it as a standard candle, so they're quite useful. Um, but we're not interested in those. What we're interested in for planets is this type here. This is where you have the planet passing in front of the star. It blocks out some of the light. And you would typically get this U shape, dip in brightness. Now, this particular graph shows a flat bottom on it, on the bottom of that U, but that's not necessarily the case um, because the star itself it's spherical, um, it's brightest in the centre part as it passes across. So it has a bit more of a curved bottom like a U as opposed to a flat bottom. But anyway, that's what we're looking for. And that U shape dip in brightness against time as it passes in front can tell us a huge amount of information about that planet. So I'm not going to give all the equations here, but if you want to, they're not actually that difficult to actually derive and work out. And if you were doing kind of the physics of the universe module, this is something that we kind of cover at the beginning of that module. So you've got that U-shaped dip in brightness. So we know the stars dim down. We can work out how much it dimmed by. So actually the vertical bit and how much it's actually um, decreased by can tell us how big the planet is. Because if you think about it, the only thing that matters there is the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. And if it's a set ratio, it's going to take out a certain percentage of the brightness of the star. So we, we can basically measure how much light is missing once the planet's in front. And that directly tells us the radius of that planet. We can also work out its orbit. So for those who are familiar with Kepler's laws, things like that, if we have planets further away from their star, they orbit slower. So they have a, a lower orbital velocity. They have a longer orbital period. So in the case of this transit here, as they pass in front of the star, it takes a longer time to actually pass in front. So the width of that can tell you its orbit, basically. So you get a huge amount of information just by looking at that fairly simple structure. And to give you an idea of that in practice, this is Kepler 11. So this is a system discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope. It had six planets in it that passed in front of the star and they were all detected. Now on the left hand side, you've actually got the individual transit as it passed in front of the star. And you can see you've got that U-shaped dip. But you can also see they're all very different. Some of them are quite deep, some of them are shallow, some of them are quite wide. Now that all, that all directly relates to the size of the planet and the orbit where they are. So if we pick out one as an example. So looking at that, I would say that planet E is probably going to be our biggest one because it blocks out the most amount of light. So if we go across to planet E on the actual the legend we have on the other side, which is, I think it's like a purple colour, it's actually four and a half times the radius of the Earth. So in astronomy, we use units that we can relate to. So if we say it's a few million metres or 100,000 metres, it doesn't mean much to us. So we actually compare to other planets. And a lot of the time we compare to, to Earth to Jupiter. So here we're using Earth radiuses, and you can see that Kepler 11e is our largest one. 
So just by looking at that structure, we can work out, you know, how big they are and where their actual um, orbits are. So on to the habitable zone then. So it's all good finding these planets, but are there any kind of suitable for life? Well, one of the key things we need to look for is the habitable zone. So we've probably heard about this before, but what it means is it's got to be the right distance from its star to have liquid water um, on its surface. So the Earth is kind of just right. Venus is kind of a bit too hot and Mars is kind of on the outer edge. So we're just right. So what we need to do is look for stars and planets around them where they're kind of in the right location. And it, it does change because stars are not all the same size. They're not all the same brightness. So small stars, planets have to be very close. Big stars, they've got to be further away. So it's just, it's just the distance we need them to be. Now, this is an interesting system because this is a, a system with seven detected planets. The TRAPPIST-1, it had seven planets and it was also stated as having seven temperate planets. So these were kind of around the habitable zone, a bit like where Venus, Earth and Mars are. So they have the potential to have liquid water on nearly all of them. Maybe the only ones are a bit suspect. But still, it's a very intriguing system. They're all kind of around that habitable zone. But have a look at where they are. It's actually a red dwarf star. And red dwarf stars are very small. They're very cool. So therefore, any planet has to, any planet to have water on them has got to be very close to them. So look at the scale there compared to our system. They're all within the orbit of Mercury. And Mercury is pretty close to our star. Uh, so these are very, very close. And to put it into context, really, this is TRAPPIST-1 compared to Jupiter. So if anyone's actually used a telescope to look at Jupiter, you can actually see the four Galilean moons. So you can see Io, Europa, um, Ganymede and Callisto through a telescope or binoculars. Well, this star has its planets pretty much the same distance that those moons are from the planet. This is a very, very compact system. And it means that they, they take about you know, one to 20 days or so to actually orbit the star. They're very, very close. Yeah. But this is the big problem. When they're too close, they have the potential to encounter these kind of large frequent flares. So red dwarf stars are fairly unstable. And I say unstable, they're quite magnetically active. So they frequently have these large flares in comparison to the size that they actually are. And because your planets have got to be close, to be habitable, you know, have liquid water on the surface, they're going to get bombarded by these large flares. So the question here is, are they really habitable? Chances are not. You're going to have these life extinguishing flares that just strip their atmospheres, they sterilise the surface. But the, the thing to take away here is that a lot of these habitable planets we hear about on the news, specifically like this one, a lot of them are orbiting red dwarf stars. So they have to be close to their star. And this is a natural consequence of being close in the red dwarf stars. They have frequent flares. Um, so we just have to you know, bear that in mind. And we haven't really found that many planets that are comparable to ours. A lot of them are around more unique or more hostile systems. Now we'll go on to the more interesting systems. This is where it gets a little bit more exciting. This is not just planets or orbiting stars. This is planets orbiting multiple stars. Now this one here, I'm not going to read out its extremely exciting name, but this is a hot Jupiter and it's orbiting three stars. Now, the orbits of the stars are with the blue lines. Um, so you can see you've got two close to each other that orbit each other. You then have a bigger one orbiting around the outside of those two. And then the red circle, the red line, is the orbit of the planet. So the, this planet orbits one star that then orbits another two. A consequence of that is that one quarter of its orbit is always experiencing day. So yeah, for one quarter of its orbit, the whole planet experiences day. So this poses some really interesting questions about what a day might be like on one of these planets. What are the seasons like? You know, imagine being on one of those planets and you've got three stars. How how hostile would that be? Is it are they actually um, habitable or not? And then. This is another one which has only recently been discovered. So this one, I believe, was confirmed in January this year, so only a few months ago. And it was first detected by Kepler, but it wasn't actually confirmed until this month with, with TESS, which is another telescope to kind of re replace Kepler. 
And this one here is orbiting the binary side. So you've got um, 5A and 5B on the left-hand side, and then you've got another star orbiting around the outside. But this planet is orbiting with a tilted orbit around the two binary stars, and then has another star going around the outside. Now, hopefully the physicists will realise that we can't have planets forming on orbits like that. We have to conserve things like um, angular momentum. So to have a tilted orbit in respect to the rest of the system suggests it's either been captured, as it you know, could have been a rogue planet with no star and it just got too close and was captured, or there's been some kind of encounter with the stars that has kind of tilted over it. There's been some interesting dynamics that has happened there. And then that you have Kepler 16b. So Kepler 16b is a Saturn-sized planet that orbits around the outside of two stars. Now, the really interesting thing about this one is it's in the habitable zone around two stars. So it's a large gas giant orbiting two small stars, but it's in the, the zone which we would be able to have liquid water. Now, some studies have been shown that you can actually have a habitable, well, I won't say habitable, but an Earth-sized moon orbiting around it, which is stable. And if it's in the habitable zone, it has the potential to support water. So you can have a moon around this planet that may be habitable, which is an intriguing idea. We haven't been able to rule it out with our models. It can it can be stable, even though you've got two stars that it's orbiting. Now, as a general rule, you have two types of planets that orbit multiple star systems. So with the P-type, they orbit around the outside of all of the stars. Now, this normally would be a lot more stable because they're going around the outside. The movement of the stars has less impact on the orbit of the planet. So they're a bit more stable. And then you have the S type. Now, these are orbiting one of the stars, and then those stars are then orbiting each other. So you have a lot more complicated dynamics occurring there, and they're not normally stable. They can't normally form like that either. So they're very interesting systems, but they wouldn't necessarily form in that current situation. So they pose some really interesting questions as how they actually got there. Now, you're probably all aware with tidally locked objects because we, we see one nearly every day, actually. So when we're talking about tidally locked planets, we're talking about an object or a planet that would always have the same face facing towards its star. So think of the moon. We only ever see one face of it. As it orbits around the Earth, it rotates once per orbit. So it means that it's always facing towards us. And it's the same for planets. We know that if they get too close to their star, you get a tidal kind of locking. So they evolve to the point where th their rotation is slowed down by the tide from the star and they will become tidally locked. And a lot of the planets we found have been close to their star therefore would be tidally locked. But are they habitable? Well, we can't rule them out, actually. They might sound quite hostile places. They're very close to their star. They've always got the same face facing towards them. So you're going to have a completely scorched surface that's always in daylight, and you'll have a very cold night side because it never gets any, any sun or any light. But... There has been some studies done that suggest you could have a habitable ring around them because if they've got an atmosphere, what will happen is they will heat that atmosphere. The, the air rises. It will then go around to the back of the planet and it will warm the back of the planet. But a consequence of that is you have very, very large winds. So you can have winds on the order of 1,000 kilometres per hour. So, you know, are they habitable? You could, you could potentially have enough light, enough temperature, but you're going to have extremes elsewhere, like with the wind. And then this one really kind of caught my eye actually this week. So this is a new one that's been discovered very, very recently. I believe actually in the last few weeks. So this was discovered by the TESS telescope and it's actually six large planets and the five outer ones are in resonance with one another. So when we talk about a resonance, what that means is that their orbits are ratios of one another. So, for example, um, for the inner, the second inner one, planet C, that does 18 orbits. But planet D does nine orbits for the same period of time. And then planet E, six, planet 
F is four, planet G is three. And that means they're all in resonance with one another. And it causes some interesting dynamics, really, because they all will always pass each other at the same location. Now, this is actually the largest resonance system to date, like this, because actually Jupiter's moons are one, but there's only four of them. This is six large planets all in resonance. And if that doesn't make any sense, maybe some swings do. So if you think about um, what's happening here, when you want to actually push someone on a swing, um, you will always push, push them at the same point at the swing. And as a result, you kind of build up that force in that direction. You kind of get a resonance. Um, the, the point is your excitation frequency needs to match your natural frequency. So you're, in this case here, your excite, excitation frequency is when and where you're pushing, and it has to match the frequency of the swing. And it's the same idea, really. As the planets pass by one another, their gravitational force on each other causes some fairly exaggerated dynamics. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be stable forever, but it just means that you're, you're creating some force in the same direction at the same time each time, and it causes um, some interesting dynamics. And then finally, I'm just going to finish with exomeans because I kind of quite I'm quite interested in these really, because we found a lot of gas giants. If you go onto the exoplanet archive and have a look at what planets we've found so far, the vast majority are big gas giants that are too close to their planet or too far away. They're not habitable. But if we take our own system, our own solar system as an example, well, there's, there's two moons that really jump out and they're not in the habitable zone, yet they have liquid oceans. So on the left hand side, you have Europa, which is orbiting Jupiter. You can actually again see this with a telescope in your back garden. And this is a frozen surface and I suspect the liquid ocean underneath. And it's a long way from the actual the sun. And Enceladus is even further away because that's orbiting Saturn. So why have they got liquid oceans? Well, they have this interaction with the planets. So it can be tidally induced. So the, the actual tides from the planet can internally heat and that can offer some kind of um, liquid oceans. There could be some other mechanisms that's not fully understood. Like there could be some radioactive decay, which is internally heating them. But the key thing is they have liquid oceans under a frozen surface. And what does this mean? Well, traditionally, if we took the habitable zone around different stars, so we've got red giant, uh, sorry, red dwarfs at the bottom on the left, nice red colour, and as you get bigger and bigger, they kind of get brighter, they get hotter. Now, to have a planet in a habitable zone, you'd have to be in that, that thin green region. But if you start to consider objects that are internally heated from some form or another, you can extend that zone outward. So have a look at that light blue and dark blue region. You can start to look for, pl for planets that may harbour moons. If the moon is big enough, it can have some internal heating and you may be able to support a liquid ocean, which is quite you know, intriguing, really. But have we found any? Well, not today. So it's kind of been on off, really, with, with Kepler 1625b. So this is a large planet. It's about 10 times the size of Jupiter. It's not small, but it was thought to have a moon the size of Neptune orbiting it. So remember at the beginning, we looked at the transit shape and we saw that you got that nice U shape dip in brightness. Well, if you had a moon orbiting it, that shape would be a bit distorted. Depending on where it was when it passed in front of the star, it changes the shape of that transit. And the signal to noise ratio of this was fairly poor and they, they keep going back and forth whether this is actually a moon or not. And that just puts into context how hard these are find, to find. This is a Neptune sized moon orbiting a planet 10 times bigger than Jupiter, and we still can't confirm if it's actually a moon or not. So we, we don't really have any evidence for them at the moment, but hopefully going forward we will. And then I'm just going to finish with Europa and Enceladus, really. And this is kind of what we think, really. So this, you've got a nice image of Europa at the bottom and an illustration of what we expect to find under that surface. So we can work out the surface by the way that the spacecraft moves nearby, how the local gravity, gravitational field changes. Um, and we can measure what's been thrown out into space. So we know that they're throwing out water ice and various um, 
material which could support life. So that's the Europa. And then you have Enceladus, which is kind of the same really. And we expect to have this frozen surface along with this liquid ocean and you know, these thermal vents at the bottom. And I would like to think going forward that we can make these some of our key targets for exploration. Because we've been there, we know that they're quite promising, but you know, we should really kind of um, go more down onto the surface and investigate kind of what's there. But that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. Um, hopefully it's kind of been interesting for you all. Um, yeah, and thanks for listening. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat um, or on the whatever it's called, and we'll let Warden go through. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Phil, for this wonderful talk. Uh, uh, so we uh, we open for questions, uh, uh, which can be uh, placed uh, directly in a live chat uh, or in a, a Padlet a link in the Padlet. You also can see in the YouTube uh, a live chat and. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, and basically, uh, before we start uh, uh, answering questions, I see there is a comment from Chris Denison that it seems we found uh, Tatooine. Yeah, so I actually took that slide off the presentation because I wanted to put some more interesting planets on. But yes, um, there's a very clear link to science fiction action, a lot of these planets we're finding. Um, they're no longer re refined or um, constrained to science fiction. They're out there in the real world, which is exciting. And, uh, I also read another comment also from Chris uh, that so exciting investigating moons in our own solar system for life. Uh, and uh, that in fact uh, relates to uh, to other questions uh, which arrived in uh, in the Padlet, uh, which tells uh, what will be the next planetary mission? Hmm. So is that a, a, a question that is that we're actually doing, or one that we'd like to see? So um, it's probably probably what you would like to see, if I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said on the last couple of slides, actually. What I want to see is to go and explore some of these moons more because they actually, in our own system, probably have the best scope for finding something interesting um, because we, they, they've got the most water, really, compared to, you know, we're, we're trying to go to Mars, well, we have gone to Mars, and we're looking for life there. But the moons, they've got these big oceans there still right now. So we can go and swim around them. OK, it's not quite that simple, but um, I think that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see some exploration below those frozen surfaces on those moons. And then there is a question in the Padlet. Could the planet at Proxima Centauri be a promising uh, candidate? So I believe that for, for life? For life. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I think that one's orbiting a red dwarf star. So if that is the case, it will have to be quite close to a star and it might be susceptible to large flares. So I'm, I'm trying to think I might, if I've got that right or not. I think it's orbiting the red dwarf star. Um, and if it is, I would probably rule it out because you don't want to be too close to a star. Um, you know, you have a flare, you can't kind of duck out of its way. And, that, and then there is, in fact, uh, a question as about Red Dwarf. Uh, in uh, Padlet, it tells, uh, uh, why is that Red Dwarfs are magnetically active? They're just, well, the, the, the way that they're kind of structured um, leads them to that. So they're very different than the larger planets. Um, 
so not planets, I mean stars. Um, so the way that they transfer the heat internally is very different. Um, so stars typically are, they're set out so that they transfer their energy from their core to their outer parts through um, convection or from um, radiative transfer. And I believe that red dwarf stars are predominantly convective, I think. Um, it just, there's not a lot of mass there either. So they are, they're just generally very magnetically active. Um, they have a lot of kind of sunspots, flares. Um, they just are, unfortunately. So it rules them out, I would say, for planets orbiting them. Uh, I see the uh, question arrived uh, uh, from David Hill in the uh, live chat. Uh, transit relies on a planet passing in front of the star. Can you model how many planets this method would miss? Um, yeah, so I believe there are some methods depending on the type of system you have. So if you have a planet that passes in front, you can work out how many planets are likely to be there that you can't see. So they might be slightly inclined. So there is a way of working that out. And it's with ultra with the ultra short period planet. So if you find a planet that is orbiting very close to its star, we're talking on the order of days, even less maybe. Um, if you find one of them, there's a very good probability that you might have extra planets. But because it's very close, it will always nearly always pass in front of the star. But you can have a planet further out and it can be slightly inclined and it will it will basically miss the star. But this then leads us to this the secondary method of detection. For those planets that don't pass in front of the star, you actually just look at the radial velocity method and you'll see the wobble of the star from any unseen planets. And actually, a lot of the time, you combine both techniques to actually get the full picture. Um, there is a, also a question from uh, Richard Brooks in, uh, um, in live chat. Uh, that is... Uh, Will James Webb Space Telescope help us to discover many more of these planets when it is launched? And will it tell us more about the existing ones discovered? Yeah, so um, um, it offers kind of a different way to look at things. Um, and also, you don't, we don't typically just use one telescope to look for one planet. You actually use a multitude of different techniques to discover them and not only discover them but once you've found it okay let's say we discover a planet it passes in front of a star let's say it's earth-like we can actually detect if it's got an atmosphere or not because we could do a spectroscopic measurement as it passed in front so different telescopes will allow us to basically look at different things so yes looking at the light of the star will tell us if we've got one but we can also take extra measurements with different Telescopes. So different telescopes have different detectors. So we can do spectroscopy, we can do various different things. They're all designed to look at very different things. So yes, we, we'll learn a lot more, you know, with these new telescopes. Uh, and and, and in, in fact, uh, yeah, this is a kind of a, a similar question was uh, actually two questions. Uh, 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 kind of related, what telescopes are used in this research? And then was another question related, if you study astrophysics, do you need a telescope? No. Um, so I'm, I'm an astrophysicist. Um, I don't really use a telescope. A lot of what I've shown you, so for example, Kepler, TESS, these are like survey telescopes that are sent into space. They just look at one part of the sky, a long period of time, they take images, they put it into a database, and then you as the astronomer or astrophysicist will go through it and try and identify things. I mean, there's so much data generated, it takes a long time to go through. But as a, a modern astrophysicist or astronomer, you're not necessarily going to be using the big telescopes. You would probably be using historic data because these telescopes are set up to just do survey work and then you kind of go through it. Um, although I have had the opportunity to use them, which was very exciting. But research now, you can do a lot of it without the telescopes. Um, I do a lot of modelling myself, but I try and match it to what I see. 
Uh, in fact, there is comment uh, arriving uh, in uh, uh, in a live chat uh, about uh, telescopes uh, that there is one right behind you, Phil. Well, I believe there is. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, okay. So since that's been pointed out, um, that's probably like a, a six inch reflecting telescope. Um, that's perfectly fine to measure and work out the, the mass of Jupiter. So you could use that to work out the mass of Jupiter by looking at how the moons move around it. And a lot of people have telescopes like that. You can even have an even smaller one. And if you actually go out every night, look at Jupiter, look at its moons, make a note of where they are, you can rearrange some equations and you can work out how heavy Jupiter is just by how those moons move around in a small telescope. Uh, there is a question uh, in Padlet from Oliver, age 11. Why do the stars orbit each other and were they always like that or were they once separate systems? So, yes, interesting question. Now, we believe that stars form in kind of groups. They don't form singly. They nearly always form in pairs or triple stars or even more. And they will form in a large cloud, a nebula, a cloud of gas, and they collapse and they kind of locally collapse. But as they then start to kind of move around, they will orbit each other. Now, we're more familiar with how planets orbit stars because one's much more bigger than the other one. So it looks like a planet goes around. But with stars, they might be the same size. So they actually will orbit a common centre of mass, like the barycentre. And that basically just means that yeah, they kind of orbit each other. If they didn't, they would, be, they would collide and become one bigger star, which does happen. OK, thank you. And uh, uh, in fact, there is a related question in Padlet. How many stars found for a planetary system? How many stars? Sorry. Um, yeah, just... Mass? I think it's related to your slides where you were talking about system with uh, three stars and a planet, and then probably question means are there what is the maximum number? I don't. Be I believe three is the most so far. I'd like to be corrected, and I'd be wrong because actually, if it's maybe I don't remember seeing one orbiting four stars. But if there is, I'd like to kind of investigate that with some models. Um, but if we then think about planets orbiting stars, I think the most we've found so far is nine, not including our own system. And that was using the radial velocity method. Um, so, yeah. And then, uh, there is another question. Uh, what made you interested in this field? I don't know, just kind of um, looking up into the sky, really, because we look up and you think it's all just stars, but they're not. If you look carefully, there's a lot of very different things there. They're not all the same colour. They're all different colours. They change their brightness. And I think it's just, it's very different to thinking of, of problems here. So when you look into space, all the problems you have here on the planet don't really matter anymore. There's, there's, there's bigger things happening out there. And it's just, I think it's a, it's a sense of unknown, actually, wanting to understand what's there. And I think most scientists will say the same thing. They want to understand things. And so you just, yeah, you just kind of capture that. And, and then uh, uh, there are a couple of generic questions I see in uh, Padlet. One is, do you believe uh, planets outside of habitable zone could contain life? Yeah, they have the potential. There's no reason why not. Um, we think of the habitable zone as what we have here, but then we don't necessarily know exactly what we need for life. All we're doing is we've got a snapshot here on our planet, and we're just going, well, it's got to be like that. We don't really know, to be honest. And provided we have a sufficient temperature, the right sort of composition, it can be anywhere. And if, again, we're like these exomoons, they're not in the habitable zone, but they are internally heated. So the bottoms of their oceans will be warm like ours. They don't have any sunlight, but 
we know life doesn't need sunlight to survive. There are other mechanisms for generating energy for them. So, yeah, as a, as a generalization, you know, we shouldn't rule things out that aren't in the habitable zone. All right. Um, and then uh, somebody's typing question, but not finished yet. So I'll look. There is another one. Um, are the tides in the movie Interstellar realistic? So, the, or the worlds? Uh, I think uh, it's referring to the huge tides in, in one of the planets uh, pictured in Interstellar, and you mentioned tides in your slides, so the question probably kind of, was it realistic depiction of possible tides? Yeah, so you're going to have quite significant tides in that sense. I'll, I'll be honest, I can't remember the exact world where it had the tides. But I do remember that a lot of the um, the time differences, the relativity that was discussed kind of in that film was generally correct. Um, there's a few things that are slightly off because it doesn't work in a film if you do it 100% correct. Um, so I remember, I think Brian Cox was the scientific advisor for Sunshine uh, a number of years ago. And scientifically, if you're watching a spacecraft go through, through space, it shouldn't make any noise. And vacuum um, but when you watch it on a screen it doesn't feel right so there's there's always a little bit that's tweaked just to make it a bit more of an enjoyable film but i think as a general rule the science was pretty good for interstellar i see there is a very uh technical question in uh, a live chart uh, from chris Dennison with resonant orbits uh, are there planets close enough uh, uh, to increase the orbital velocity of each other? And if they line up, are the planets large enough to drastically affect their sun? Um, well, technically, yes. Because when you go back to that radial velocity method, um, the planets have a direct hand in how that star moves. So the star does wobble about just by the movement of the actual planets. Um, but if you've got resonance of there, then, yeah. Well, it, it, it depends if the resonances are all on the same side because you've got multiple planets there. They could actually be distributed all the way around. They don't necessarily fit for, for like two planets could be one direction. The next two could be on the other side. So it depends how they all add up, but they, they do affect how a star moves anyway because that's how we detect them with the radial velocity method. And uh, we are uh, approaching uh, final minutes, but there is actually one more question just arrived. Uh, can there be a life without water? Um, that's definitely taking me out of my knowledge zone. Um, you'd be probably better speaking to uh, an astrobiologist or something. Um, but I do remember speaking to an astrobiologist a long time ago at a conference. And he said they would, they've basically run experiments where they've given everything we think you need for life um, in a sealed chamber or container, and not once have they actually managed to spontaneously create it. It's very confusing. But I can't answer the question on if, we, if we do need water or not, because it's more biology, I suspect. Um, uh, in, in fact, there are two questions being typed uh, right now in the last minutes. Uh, one is, can planets orbit in opposite directions? Yes, they can. So you would typically refer to that planet as being on a retrograde orbit. Now, we have moons in our own solar system that are retrograde. What it tells us, if you if you look at the physics of it, they cannot form like that because um, it, it basically violates conservation laws. But it means that you can actually have it come from ex at some external source and be captured. So if it comes too close, gravitationally, it can be captured. Now, a good example of that is actually um, Triton, which is a moon with an atmosphere which is bigger than Pluto, and it orbits Neptune. Now, that's retrograde, orbits the wrong way. Um, which is really interesting, actually. So that is a captured minor planet. You know, it's bigger than Pluto, and it's been captured in our own system. And we have found planets 
that are orbiting opposite to the rotation of the star, which would suggest they're captured or they've been scattered in some form or other. So yes, all of these really weird scenarios do exist. Yeah, so it looks like reality uh, even more exciting than uh, science fiction can be. Uh, yeah. and, and with that, uh, we arrive, oh, there is just maybe last 30 seconds of one uh, from Sue Flower. Have planets been found that are not spherical? Well, um, yes, because actually, if there is any, any kind of rotation there, then actually they are, they, they, you have what we would classify as like an oblateness. So it basically means a non sphericalness to the planet, and most planets show that. So even our own planet shows that. Um, it's going to be a, a direct consequence of their rotation rate, because once they get to a certain size, then gravitationally they're kind of sculpted to be spherical. If you spin it really fast, then obviously you can counteract that around the equator. So they become a little bit kind of um, washed at the poles. And we, we refer to that as the oblateness. Yeah, that, there's quite a lot of people that aren't spherical. And uh, I think this brings us perfectly on time to the conclusion of this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, afternoon with this uh, fantastic uh, news from the sky. I would like uh, to thank uh, Phil again. Thank you very much, Phil, uh, yep. for this great uh, talk and uh, all the questions. And i will like to thank the audience uh, which uh, listened to, to, to the talk and asked uh, all kind of interesting questions uh, uh, from all over uh, uh, the, including uh, Oliver, who is 11 years old, asked very a deep question. So, Thank you, thank you all very much, uh, and we hope to see you in uh, uh, one of our following uh, lectures, which also tomorrow and uh, uh, and uh, run till Friday. And when pandemic is over, we hope to see you uh, face to face in our uh, uh, wonderful campus and our wonderful Isaac Newton building for our uh, returned. Uh, um, public lectures. Thank you very much and goodbye.